I'd like to thank you for showing up to our event honoring Wellstone. And we're going to be calling this a tribute, questions, and a call for justice. What I'd like to do is start with a moment of silence for the people that were tragically killed um, on October 25th, 2002, and that would be, of course, Senator Paul Wellstone, his wife Sheila, Marsha Wellstone Markinson, aides Mary McAvoy, Tim Lappick, and Will McLaughlin, and Captain Richard Connery, and co-pilot Michael Guess. Amen and shalom. I'd also like a moment of silence for the people that died in military conflicts in the United States, for non-combatant citizens that uh, Paul Wellstone tried to prevent. Amen and shalom. The reason we're here is to honor a man that was recently called irreplaceable. And what made Paul Wellstone irreplaceable? Was it the fact that he had the courage to speak truth to power and stand up for the little guy? Was it the fact that he was willing to take on the fight that nobody else was willing to take on? Recently, at another event, Governor Mark Dayton made a reference to Senator Wellstone, saying that Paul Wellstone was in communications and, and had the possibility of running for president against George Bush in 2004, and that he would have run against John Kerry in the Democratic primary and likely would have won that, and um, would have been a very formidable foe against President Bush and likely would have won. So we have to contemplate what that we would now be coming out of what was the end of the second term of a Wellstone presidency and what the world might look like with respect to that. I'm a national security whistleblower affiliated with financial crimes at the regulatory level and illegal domestic surveillance. Uh, I was referred to by a national syndicated columnist as being too much of a hero. But Paul Wellstone was too much of a hero. And he was also a whistleblower. That wasn't part of his job description. And one of the things that I'd like to talk about is that, you know, Paul was working on very specific legislation that nobody else would take on. And one of those things was the 2002 Senate Bill 3143, the Consumer and Shareholder Protection Association Act. Now, what that would have done, if enacted, was have prevented, if not, you know, greatly mitigated the 2008 financial collapse because Senator Wellstone knew what the problem was. And the problem was regulatory capture. No matter what political party is in power at the time, that we have rules in place, they're just not enforced equally. And so that the problem was corruption at the regulatory level with the Security Exchange Commission and the financial uh, regulators, um, the CFTC, FINRA. And so he proposed a piece of legislation that would have given access to the common person, retribution, so when these financial collapses and crises would, would appear and the SEC would not hold anybody accountable, um, the Consumer and Shareholder Protection Association Act would. Now what I've got here is a copy of a Senate report from 2006 with regards to Fannie Mae. And if anybody lost money in the 2008 financial crisis, and that was about, uh, average net loss was 40% of, of people's net worth. But this is a congressional report from the Senate Banking Committee in 2006 uh, investigating Fannie Mae. And what they found was that Fannie Mae was able to write their own rules or have rules that worked for them, written for them. That Franklin Raines, the CEO, violated the trust of the public and encouraged rapid growth uh, without proper internal controls or risk management and caused Fannie Mae, uh, the Fannie Mae's executives were enriching themselves through earnings manipulation. Fannie Mae's management directed employees to manipulate accounting and earnings to trigger maximum bonuses for senior executives. Management manipulated accounting and reaped maximum undeserved bonuses, prevented the rest of the world from knowing about it. Nobody was held accountable for that. And Paul Wellstone wanted to hold those people accountable. The other thing that Senator Wilson was involved with was being uh, under surveillance since 1970 by the FBI. 
And this is a quote that stated, at the same time, the capacity to assert social and political control over the individual will vastly increase. As I've already noted, it will soon be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date, complete files containing even most personal information about the health or personal behavior of the citizen. In addition to more customary data, these files would be subject to instantaneous retrieval by authorities. The next comment was Senator Frank Church during the Tower Commission. The National Security Agency's capability at any time could be turned around on the American people, and no American would have any privacy left, such as the capability to monitor everything, telephone conversations, telegrams, it doesn't matter. There would be no place to hide. If a dictator ever took over the NSA, they could enable it to impose total tyranny, and there would be no way to fight back. That was 1975. The preceding quote from Zbigniew Zabrinsky was in 1968. So you can imagine what we had now. So at the time of the death of Senator Paul Wellstone, this country went into a collapse socially, economically, morally, culturally, and we lost a lot of our rights. We lost a lot of privacy protections. We lost our uh, freedoms and liberties associated with the Constitution. Uh, for what we were told was for purposes of security, and safety, and we are neither secure nor free. Those are the types of, of fights that Paul Wellston would take on when nobody else would. And we're all on the receiving end of that type of, uh, of activity now. When you're a fighter, when you're a principled pugilist like Paul Wellstone, you took on all enemies. When you were told not to go there, he went there. And he went there in large part alone. And he was a if, if he was the friend of the people, he was also the enemy of a lot of very powerful interests. And we had the opportunity to watch um, the earlier campaign videos, but how many people might remember this one? In 1990, you elected me to fight for working families, and that is exactly what I've done. Now the Republicans are spending millions to come at me with every kind of false and ridiculous attack they can dream up, because I will not support the Gingrich Dole agenda. I will not vote for their extreme cuts in Medicare, nursing home care, and education just to pay for a tax cut for the rich. That's plain wrong. I will stand up for Minnesota families and for what's right, no matter what kind of scary monster they send after me. It was almost like he knew that the people that he was willing to do battle with were monsters and were willing to do anything. The next video I'd like to show is um, Piece of news that dropped about uh, the end of September, and how many people remember seeing this? I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough, and it's very hard for me to see how the United States uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Um, which leads me to conclude that if, in fact, compromise is not coming, that the traditional way of Amer America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall he had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, yes. until the Maine exploded. And may I point out, that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. One can combine other means of pressure with sanctions. Uh, I mentioned that explosion uh, on August 17th. Uh, we could step up the pressure. I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? <laughs> we can do a variety of things if we wish to increase the pressure. I'm not advocating that, but I'm just suggesting that uh, it, it, it's, this, this is not a, a either-or proposition of, you know, it's just sanctions has to, has to succeed or other things. We are in the game of using covert means against the Iranians. We, we could get nastier at that. How many people here have seen that video? You just got a lesson in American history that you didn't get in high school. 
And basically what this individual is claiming, it works for a Washington think tank, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, uh, basically telling us that um, pretty much every war the United States has ever been involved in uh, came as the result of a false flag. It needed some type of initiation or a kickstart. Those are the kind of people, subhuman, that Paul Wellstone had a problem with. And they had a problem with him. Now, how many people would recognize the person that said this quote? Because the United States has a long record of supporting terrorists and using terrorist tactics, the slogans of today's war on terrorism merely makes the United States look hypocritical to the rest of the world. By any measure, the U.S. has long used terrorism. In 1978-79, the Senate was trying to pass a law against international terrorism. In every version they produced, the lawyers said the U.S. would be in violation. That wasn't Paul Wellstone. Sounded like something maybe he possibly would have said. That was Lieutenant General William Odom, the director of the NSA under Ronald Reagan. Those are the people that Paul Wilson had a problem with. When, when our American diplomacy ends up being indiscriminately dropping bombs on people or uh, sanctions as a recourse. Now, one of the things that Paul is best well known for is this Iraq war speech. The administration seeks our authorization now for military action. This debate, colleagues, must include all Americans, because our decisions finally must have the informed consent of the American people, who will be asked to bear the costs in blood and treasure of our decisions. When the lives of sons and daughters of average Americans could be risked and lost, their voices must be heard in the Congress before we make decisions about military action. I believe many Americans still have profound questions about the wisdom of relying too heavily on a, preempt, on a preemptive, go-it-alone military approach. Acting now on our own might be a sign of our power. Acting sensibly and in a measured way, in concert with our allies, with bipartisan congressional support, would be a sign of our strength. There have been questions raised about the nature and urgency of Iraq's threat and our response to that threat. What is the best course of action that the United States could take to address this threat? What are the economic, political, and national security consequences of possible United States or allied invasion of Iraq? There have been questions raised about the consequences of our actions abroad, including its effects on the continuing war on terrorism, our ongoing efforts to stabilize and rebuild Afghanistan, and efforts to calm the intensifying Middle East crisis, especially the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And there, have been and there have been questions raised about the consequences of our actions here at home. Of greatest and of gravest concern, obviously, are the questions raised about the possible loss of life that could result from our actions. The United States could post tens of thousands of troops in Iraq, and in so doing, we risk countless lives of United States soldiers and innocent Iraqis. Authorizing the preemptive, go-it-alone use of force right now which is what the resolution before us calls for, in the midst of continuing efforts to enlist the world community to back a tough new disarmament resolution on Iraq could be a very costly mistake for our country. Madam Chair, I quite often in debates, at uh, the end of debates on amendments, we um, thank our staff for the work that they've done and appreciate their hard work. I would, at the end of my statement today on the floor of the United States Senate, as to why I am opposed to the resolution that will be before us and that we will be debating today and in the days to come, which is too open-ended and would provide the President with authority for preemptive military action 
including ground evasion in Iraq. Um, I would like to um, thank my staff. Where's that voice today? He's been replaced by people like Patrick Clausen from the Washington Institute for New York Policy who jokes about starting World War III. Think about what we would have had if not for the tragic events of the day 10 years ago with, with the plane crash. With all due respect to crab fishermen and our military, whistleblowing is the world's most hazardous profession. And he was one of the whistleblowers. It wasn't his, part of his job description. Now, Colleen was making reference to, when will we dummy up? I mean, we've got a populace that's more interested in honey boo-boo and hillbilly hand fishing to know that we're just about ready to get duped into World War III, which is going to involve Russia and China. Thanks to our friend, Mr. Clawson. If we could bring up my friend Smedley. Now, those in the military might recognize this name. General Smedley Butler. Um, basically, he was an American Superman. Uh, he was a two-time Medal of Honor recipient. Uh, he served in the Spanish-American War. He served in uh, war conflicts in South America and Mexico, World War I. And then he had an epiphany, and he came to the conclusion, saying, I spent 33, months and four mo 33 years and four months in active service as a member of our country's most agile force, the U.S. Marine Corps. I served in all commissioned ranks from second lieutenant to major general. And during that period, I spent most of my time being a high-class muscle man for big business, Wall Street, and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer for capitalism. I suspected I was part of a racket all of the time. Now I'm certain of it. Like all members of the military profession, I've never had an original thought until I left service. We're trying to run a theme here. There's a historical context of things that are happening. And if people just have an exposure to what we've done in the past, and people, you know, brave, courageous people that took a stand like Smedley Butler. Now, not too long after saying this, the uh, United States was getting involved in World War II, and Smedley Butler met an untimely death. What I'd like to say, too, is I appreciate everybody showing up, and um, thank the efforts of uh, everybody that helped put this uh, effort forward. Now, we did anticipate more people with um, the, uh, the help of progressive groups. Um, we put out a call to them and naively kind of anticipated that, considering that this was an event to honor Senator Wellstone, that um, we would get some type of a cooperation or equivalency. And that didn't happen. So when we're looking at the events related to the death of Paul Wellstone, I, th I think people's first conclusion comes to mind is that that dog don't hunt. You know, we've seen this before. Two years before Senator Wellstone died was the death of Governor Mel Carnahan. And why is it that Democrats, mostly outspoken Democrats, seem to be killed uh, in airplane crashes? Statistical anomaly. The other thing is that we are asked to trust the two entities that, hold, that held the most gain uh, by the death of Senator Wellstone. And that, in fact, was the Bush administration, Cheney and Roe, um, the people that had actually warned, uh, Vice President Cheney had warned Paul Wellstone about things such as his Iraq war vote and, you know, poking his nose into things that he wasn't supposed to be looking at. And uh, Vice President Cheney gave Senator Wellstone a warning a couple of weeks before he died about, you know, serious ramifications to the people of uh, your state, Minnesota, um, if you don't get with the program. If you haven't been exposed to the truth and you're getting it for the first time tonight, um, we ask that you share that uh, with your friends because uh, we will be calling for an investigation or at least a public hearing into the findings of the government, the National Transportation Safety Board, and the FBI with regards to this crash. In the event, if people believe that there might be a possibility, then we owe that to Paul Wellstone and his family, and the staffers, and the pilots. If you refuse to believe it, I'm sorry, but there's nothing that you, we can do. 
for you. We have war criminals on Fox News telling us what we need to do. We have a, a Republican presidential candidate that wants to outfit his foreign policy with the Bush administration hacks. Um, and Paul Wellstone is dead. Where's the justice? Well, I want to close this out by a call for justice. And I hope this makes a little bit of sense to you about tonight's discussion, that it contains truths which, if understood by the masses, would tend to awaken them to real dangers with, which threaten our free institutions. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And the people too indifferent or too self-satisfied to be mindful of their liberties are unworthy of such a boon. Republics are lost because their guardians, the people, entrust them to scheming politicians. We did not profit by the experience of other republics, but we followed in their footsteps. And in their downfall, we see our impending doom. That such a doom may be averted. I believe to be the desire of every patriotic citizen. And if, through these discussions, people are awakened to a consciousness of impending danger, I shall feel that this labor has not been in vain, that a revolution is upon us, that let us see to it that this sacrifice by people like Paul Wellstone is wrought by ballots rather than bullets. Never in the history of the world have the means for imparting information been con conducted on such an extensive and magnificent scale than at present time. Yet never have the masses been more ignorant of their condition or more mystified as to the real cause of their afflictions. Distracted by misfortune, blinded by prejudice, disheartened and bewildered, they are easy prey to the demagogue whose profession it is to mislead and entrap them in political snares to awaken people, to awaken people and direct them in their search for the real source of evils that have overtaken them is the aim and object of this discussion tonight. The people should be trusted when left to act in their own intelligent convictions, for the interests of the masses are identical. An injury to one is of the concern to all. But blinded by party prejudice or unacquainted with the methods of political tricksters, they are easily deceived and led to act or vote in direct opposition to their own best interest and judgment. The intelligence of the people is the only safeguard of liberty, and through this discussion, if one ray of light or hope shall be given to the distressed millions of my country, this labor of love tonight will not be in vain. Boy, I would have loved to have written that, um, and I hope it made sense to you. And I have people telling me we need to write a book, but this is historical in perspective. Um, the author of that testimony was Sarah E. Vandevoort Emery, and she wrote that in 1893 and 1894. Her books were Seven Financial Conspiracies Which Have Enslaved the American People, 1894. Imperialism in America, Its Rise and Progress. If we don't learn from history, if we don't stand up for the truth, if we don't take action, if we don't hold the people accountable for these atrocities, we're going to have the same mistakes. Take a stand, stand up, call your congressman, visit your congressman, force them to take action. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for supporting this effort.